Welcome to the podcast series titled Global Resilience for National Cybersecurity, Strengthening the Interconnections Among Actors. This is Greta Nasi, co-director of the Master of Science in Cyber Risk Strategy and Governance, jointly offered by Bocconi University and Polytechnic of Milan. Together with Professor MacArthur, adjunct professor at Bocconi, we discuss with our guests key topics on the role of government and cybersecurity. This project was made possible thanks to a grant from the U.S. Mission to Italy, and it holds the patronage of the Italian Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission. The topic of national security and citizens' privacy interest is complex, and it always involves a delicate debate and balance between the two. On the one hand, governments have a responsibility to ensure the safety and security of their citizens and protect against potential threats, including those that may originate from within the country or abroad. This can involve collecting and analyzing large amounts of data related to individuals or groups who may threaten national security. On the other hand, citizens have a right to privacy and protection from unwarranted surveillance or intrusion into their personal life. The collection and analysis of sensitive or personal data by government agencies can raise concerns about potential violations of privacy, as well as the possibility of abuse of power or overreach by those in positions of authority. While tensions may exist, national security and citizens' privacy interests can align. In this podcast, we discuss these concepts with Professor Suzanne Landau, Bridge Professor of Cybersecurity and Policy, the Fletcher School and School of Engineering, Department of Computer Science at Tufts University. Colin, over to you. Professor Landau, thanks so much for joining us today and here in Milano. We're so excited to have you. Maybe we could start our discussion uh, with a broad question. In your work, how do you define national security? So, I don't get to define national security, but national security is protecting the security and safety of people within a country. It used to be a lot about territorial integrity, uh, but in fact, with the introduction of the telegram and then the telephone, and now, of course, cyber, it has really changed, and it includes protecting from threats that can come in in ways that one doesn't expect. People were originally quite scared of of the effects of the telegram and the telephone. It turns out, in fact, that the effects of cyber are are real, as opposed to the others, which were more in people's minds than than an actual fact. And so, you know, you talked about basically the cyberspace. How do you think that that fits in? Can you elaborate on what you just said? For Sure. So the internet, uh, we think of as a form of communication, and it absolutely is. It's both a form of communication and it's a form of control. We know how to control systems remotely, and that's, in fact, one of the types of threats, cyber attacks that come in remotely, uh, whether they're attacks against the power grid or uh, attacks of of other sorts. Uh, But in recent years, we've also seen threats that come in in the form of information, and we've seen... uh, deployment of information warfare, for example, against the French election in 2016, and of course, against the U.S. election in in 2016 and other times. Fantastic. And would you say that uh, the approaches that countries need to take in preserving national security in cyberspace are different than in the other spaces they govern? You know, is, is this really a new or different challenge for governments? It's a completely new challenge, and it's one we haven't really figured out how to handle. So a decade ago, we in the United States heard the words that we're worried about a cyber Pearl Harbor, a devastating attack on infrastructure after a time of of political uh, dispute between several nations. Uh, We haven't seen anything like that. We've seen what we call gray zone conflicts, conflicts that don't rise to the level of actual warfare but do uh, do are disruptive. We've seen them against South Korea. We've seen them against various countries in Europe, especially, of course, Ukraine, even prior to the Russian attack on Ukraine. Uh, we've seen them against the United States, and they're carried out by a variety of actors, including Russia, uh, China, uh, most particularly against Southeast Asian nations, uh, North Korea, and Iran. Uh, but we've seen them again by enacted by other countries as well. Uh, and those are those are problematic 
but they haven't risen to the devastating attacks that we first discussed when we, we used the term cyber Pearl Harbor. So you mentioned those are problematic. Could you say more about why these gray zone type of attacks, uh, conflicts, pose a challenge for governments and why they need to start thinking and, and, and governing them? So we've seen a variety of different attacks. Uh, the first kind uh, were the DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service that take down websites. And while as a computer scientist, I think of those as not hard to handle because once the attack stops, everything goes back to normal. From a political point of view uh, and a military point of view, they are problematic. And they are, pro they are especially problematic when they occur in the midst of kinetic attacks, which happened on the Russian attacks on Georgia back in 2008. And then in order to respond, the Georgian government went offline. But because the Russians had already bombed some of the communications infrastructure, it meant that the Georgians were not in communication with their government. And they didn't know if the attacks by the Russians were, in fact, more serious than they turned out to be. So that's one, one type of set of actions. In 2015 and again in 2016, uh, the Russians began attacking Ukrainian power grids with great seriousness, taking them offline for periods of time in the cold Ukrainian winter. That's that's very serious. The North Koreans have used the Internet as a way to make money by conducting ransomware attacks. And while this is a criminal activity uh, for the banks that, that are have been the subject of them and other institutions, this is really problematic. It appears that the Russians uh, launched what's called the NotPetya attack against uh, Ukraine, which was an attack that uh, was a virus that essentially stopped the computers from working, but it spread well past Ukraine into uh, the rest of the world. It took down the Danish shipping company Maersk, uh, which is responsible, I think, for something like one-seventh of shipping of the world's goods. And it was only because there was a laptop under repair in Africa that Maersk was able to come back as quickly as it did electronically. It still took a matter of over a week, is my memory of that. Uh, so those are the types of kinds of attacks that are very disruptive. What we haven't seen is the deployment of cyber uh, well integrated into kinetic attacks. That was expected with the Russian war on Ukraine. It hasn't happened for a number of reasons, including the fact that it's very hard to coordinate kinetic and cyber attacks. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it might not happen in the future. So if we focus on, you know, this type of attacks that you just described, um, if you were to advise policymakers, you know, into setting up policies or strategies that, you know, will help them in mitigating this possible risks or also anticipating the impact of this, uh, you know, cyber Pearl Harbor, um, what would be the key principles to keep in mind for them? So from the nuclear era, we talk about deterrence by punishment, and, and that's clear in the nuclear era what you mean. It means having your own wep nuclear weapons or deterrence by denial. And it's really the second that makes sense in the cyber realm. You can talk about having destructive weapons, but there's no reason to limit yourself in responding to a cyber attack with a cyber weapon. You could respond in, in other ways. But deterrence by denial, making your systems more secure. And that doesn't mean preventing intruders from getting in, because that seems relatively impossible. Rather, it means building resilient systems so that the most important aspects of your of your of the cyber role, whatever it is that that your computer systems are doing, those most important aspects are still able to work or able to come back quickly after an attack. And so we've seen some effort in the United States uh, under the Biden administration of doing better deterrence by denial, not just for government systems, but also for private sector. But a lot more remains to be done. So if the uh... Cyber per arbor is not happening, but there's this gray space in which you know things are occurring. And you were to advise policymakers, what are the key principles or concern to keep in mind? We don't really know yet where the limit is, where something goes out of the gray zone and into a real attack and a response, and there need to be clearer rules. Uh, we do not have any international agreements on not attacking critical infrastructure. And that's 
that's crucial because as our systems become more and more computer controlled, uh, it's really problematic. Not It's much more than problematic. It is uh, life-threatening to have critical infrastructure attacked. There's also issues uh, of the technology, and the technology is very interesting in the sense that in order to do a cyber attack, the adversary goes into a computer system, explores, maybe sends some information out so that the the conductor of the attack can learn more and decide where exactly to put bat malware and so on. But in that exploration and sending data out, it is really uh, what's called a cyber exploit. It's spying. And while we all think of spies as terrible people, in fact, and, and, and spying is just a terrible thing to do and so on and so forth, unless they're spying for our country and keeping us safer. In fact, spying is tolerated internationally. It's a crime domestically. That is, somebody spying on your country, caught in your country, is doing a criminal activity. But at the same time, your government sends spies out. In many ways, spies spying also keeps us safer uh, and, and the analogy or the example I like to go to is the Cuban Missile Crisis, which as close as it brought us to nuclear war, the fact is it would have been a much more serious crisis if the U.S. had not discovered that the Russians were planning to put nuclear weapons on Cuba until after they had done so. And it was spy planes that, that uncovered this information. Knowing what your adversary is doing and what your adversary isn't doing is often a way of keeping both sides safer. And this is understood by governments, even though it is not necessarily talked about in public. So if we focus on spying governments, uh, we fully understand why, you know, it may keep us safer. But if we're spying on individuals, then this is a concern that all of us have. And, you know, it's something that we should consider. So in your opinion, what is the link between national security and the privacy of individuals? Well, uh, that's a very complex question that, that will take years to answer, but I'll try and do it quickly. We've always seen, or up till recently, we've seen national security as conducting surveillance, including sometimes national security conducts surveillance of people internal to the country, and then you run into serious issues of privacy. But because of the big data world we live in, it is the case that lots of information about individuals is available not just to the government inside the country, but to adversaries outside the country. And that kind of information makes a country less secure rather than more secure. So there are places where the interests of national security and privacy are aligned. We saw it, for example, during the crypto wars, which are still ongoing, uh, the wars about whether or not people should have access to end-to-end -end encryption, which keeps their communications safe, or data encryption, which keeps data at rest on their phones or in their laptops safe. And for a long time, U.S. national security argued against the deployment of end-to-end -end encryption. It changed in 2000 when it uh, loosened export controls, as did Europe at the same time. But in fact, in recent years, we've even seen former heads of the National Security Agency and a former head of the British Signals Intelligence Agency, GCHQ, argue that uh, that end-to-end -end encryption is important and useful. And that's because so much data within a country is important to keep secret from adversaries outside. And if you make it easy for governments inside, that is, the U.S. government to spy on U.S. people, the the British government to spy on Brits, the Italian government to spy on, on people in Italy, then you also often make it easier for adversaries, adversarial nations to do so. And that weakens national security rather than improves it. Do you think there should be a role for citizens? You know, in uh, should, they, should, should they have a certain level of awareness about, you know, what is going on and the need for governments to keep them safer by collecting some sort of information? Or uh, would you think that especially in the time of, you know, fake news, misinformation, the, the, the type of, you know, communication that's delivered to individuals may shape the effect of policies that go in this direction? So I certainly believe in an educated populace that understands the role of government, understands how government works, 
understands what we call in the United States checks and balances. And I apologize here, I don't know enough about Italian government to know what the checks and balances are in the Italian uh, situation. But uh, you can't think about what information a government should have on an individual unless you understand the rights and protections that an individual has against the government. And uh, so it's a complex set of things to learn. Uh, the Northern European countries have been really good about teaching about disinformation and and so on for a long time now. They, they are in a part of the world that is subject to those types of attacks from first the Soviet Union and now Russia. And so they've educated their populace for a long time about these kinds of things. Uh, it is a complex set of things you want to teach about the role of government, the rights and responsibilities of citizens, what people can, uh, what can be learned when, when businesses or uh, adversaries or governments learn about private information from you. And it's a lot to absorb. It's not something you can take a 30-year-old business person or a or a 35-year-old father with a full-time job and two kids at home. Uh, you can't do a whole set of courses, you know, one evening, uh, three times a week uh, for, you know, 10 weeks. That's just not plausible. It's something you have to start early. Uh, and it's important because we live in a complex society and, and citizens understanding their rights, their roles, and threats take time to absorb. Fantastic. So we talked a little bit about how in end-to-end -end encryption, the interests of national security and privacy are, are aligning. Are there other areas where you've seen this alignment? Uh, I have not explicitly seen this alignment in other places, but uh, the U.S. government is certainly aware that the massive data collection that is occurring by the private sector raises threats. And you see it uh, in terms of their response to TikTok, uh, because that's t a tiny piece of the company is owned by a Chinese company. But what TikTok has, the information that TikTok has is not different than thousands of data brokers in the United States have, and that other countries may get a hold of in various ways. So even though that piece is not being discussed publicly, there's certainly an understanding of, of the issues there. Absolutely. And it it begs the question, okay, given that uh, the individuals and organizations and businesses have a, a role to play in this environment, but also limits on their resources and time, how does government policy need to evolve to align these interests? Sort of what are the next steps? Well, uh, usually what happens in a situation like that, or one, one way that things happen, is you have scholars thinking about the issues. You have uh, civil society organizations distilling these, these tomes from the academics into actionable items. You have both sets of people talking with governments. And you see some of that, uh, not as much as is needed, but you do see some of that. And what, what do those tomes say? <laughs> <laughs> the tomes at the moment, well, for a long time, the, the fight was over end-to-end -end encryption and uh, secured devices. And that remains the issue, especially here in Europe, uh, where the EU is talking about ways uh, to make it harder to have private information on, on, on personal devices, including phones. And so that's where the, the public debate sits right now. Uh, and it moves in exactly the way I've just described, from academic tomes to blog posts to meetings and briefings with uh, with people in government, whether in the EU or in individual governments uh, in Europe or in the United States. There's less of a debate on this particular issue in the United States, although some. Uh, the other things are still percolating rather than being active issues right now, with the exception of TikTok. So um, if you go in this direction... And you look at Europe and the United States that recently issued a new cyber strategies. What are the priorities that are still, you know, to be governed? And do you envisage any difference between the EU and the US? You just mentioned the EU is still very much into individuals' privacy, which is the case. The US is probably moving in this direction too. But what are the other 
key priorities to take into account. So the U.S. has been very slow on putting requirements on of cybersecurity on the private sector. In the executive order of 2021, for example, it finally says if you're a contractor selling to the U.S. government, then you have these cybersecurity requirements that have to be instituted quickly. And the point about that is once the contractor institutes them, then the contractor has them in their systems for when they sell to private sector. And that provides a little bit of an incentive and push to push that kind of rollout. There are also requirements in that same executive order on communications service providers rep- uh, rep- reporting to the government within, I believe, three days on attacks. Uh, that, again, is something that should have been around for a long time, but it is now. Uh, so that's one thing. On the issue of privacy, while the EU has led with GDPR, the efforts on containing child sexual abuse material is leading in the opposite direction, away from privacy and intruding on personal devices. And the U.S. does not seem to be following the same path as as the EU is there. So I would say that the U.S. is on that one aspect more privacy protective, perhaps because there's the understanding of the national security threat that exists when uh, when people's personal devices are intruded upon. But there I say perhaps, because I'm not fully sure of the reasons why the U.S. is is not moving in the European direction. What, you know, what you're discussing about these priorities and everything lead me to, you know, a thought. And the thought is the ultimate goal of national security remains implicit in its operationalization. And I mean, it's okay because I mean, you shouldn't be be explicit about what it is, because otherwise your adversaries would know about that. But um, in my context, uh, public administration, um, this also kind of takes away the responsibility for steering towards objectives, all in the same directions, especially you know, at the level of public officials. So my question would be. What are today the key impact that we aim at making with cybersecurity strategies besides defense? And how are they interconnected? When you talk about critical infrastructure, for example, I totally take the point that we need to have business continuity. But you also mentioned the life threat, which is, you know, obvious. Thus, is this piece of information informing the decision making about what should be encrypted or how we should report certain information or as you were suggesting you know an international treaty about you know an agreement or not attacking critical infrastructure so what are the main ultimate goals that you know affect the societal level besides you know the the single existence of a nation state, if you wish. So increasingly, national security and economic security are very closely linked. And uh, it has been, the U.S. is very much an anti-regulatory state. And so there hasn't been this push for ensuring cybersecurity of industry in the way that Maybe there's been a push for ensuring cybersecurity of the government sector, although effectiveness has been remarkably slow. This has lots to do with the fall of the Soviet Union, the sense that uh, democracies and capitalism were all doing fine, the September 11th attacks, which changed focus, and the failure to recognize uh, the rise of Russia as or the attempted rise of Russia as a great power, uh, and and China uh, in its economic warfare against the West. So we live in a state in which uh, we have not yet understood how to address cyber threats, partially because we weren't paying attention enough to 20 years ago, and partially because the technology has been changing so remarkably rapidly. Uh, it is only, it's under two decades since smartphones were introduced. Smartphones show where an individual is, uh, are a computer that is carried around with individuals all the time, and they're computers which 
uh, now have over half the web accesses in the world occur uh, via smartphones rather than over desktops and so on. So all of a sudden you have a tremendous linking of the virtual and the personal. That rapid change of technology combined with a misattention for the last 25 years has led to us to a state where cybersecurity is appallingly weak at the same time that the threats are growing. And so you could put all the world's resources into ensuring cybersecurity, but that doesn't make sure that the hospitals work and the trains run on time and all the other things that you need to do. And so uh, we're slow on doing what we should have been doing. Had we been looking at it, if we had looked with the right foresight 25 years ago, would we have done it right? Hard to know. Uh, but we didn't, and we haven't. Fair enough. It, it leads me to a question that I know my former government colleagues ask every time you know we, we have these discussions about new uh, policy approaches and tactics, which is how do we measure success of this approach? What what can we use as evidence that this is working? And it, and in this area, it seems a little complicated. Often we're saying we're successful if something doesn't happen, which is pretty hard to count. Um, so as you as you describe this sort of broader goal and and important ends of of this work and of national security. How do you think we go about measuring or operationalizing that? Do you have any, any insights on the future of that? Fortunately, I don't work in a business school, so I don't have to measure this way. <laughs> but uh, I would say that, you know, the MAD doctrine, mutual assured destruction doctrine, disturbing as it was, we didn't have nuclear war from 1945 to the present day. So saying something didn't happen is, is already good. And when I talk about something that didn't happen, we all anticipated that there would be cyber, uh, major cyber aspect to the Russian attack on Ukraine. It is certainly true that there have been attempts, uh, and it's certainly the case because the Canadian security establishment and Microsoft and others have said that the Russian skills are still quite good. But the fact is that that, that has not occurred, and in part that's not occurred because of coordination between governments and between governments and the private sector. And so I think the measuring what didn't happen is, is actually the right way to go for now. Uh, maybe at some point we will achieve a, a reasonable treaty on cyber and, uh, and possibly information warfare, although that one seems much harder to do for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but in the interim, measuring what didn't happen seems to me a, a pretty effective way to go. Fair, fair enough. Uh, and maybe I can throw in one more question that occurred to me. Uh, does anything keep you up at night in this space? Is there anything that you really worry about or think we're not addressing uh, as societies or governments? There are lots of things that keep me up at night. <laughs> um, I worry that the people in government don't understand the technology well enough to be able to govern effectively. And I've seen that in discussions in the EU, and I've seen that in discussions in the US. And the result is we don't get the policy we need. Uh, trying to train people in government, they don't have to become uh, experts in cyber. They have to be able to ask a question and be able to understand the answer to a level that makes good policy. And it it's, they don't have to, have to understand how a nuclear weapon works in order to understand that accumulate, in order to, but what they do need to know is that accumulating uh, uranium and, and sifting it in the right way is dangerous and uh, what things a society has to look out for. We don't have that same sophistication in cyber by people in the government. And uh, at the policymakers, there are people in the government who do understand this level, and it's better than where we were 10 or 20 years ago. But as we've become a society more dependent on technology, educating policymakers in technology is something that, that seems to me crucially important. 
Well, Professor Landau, thank you so much for joining us here today and, and for your thoughts and, and wisdom on this topic. We're, we're so happy you could join us. And just to conclude and, and reinforce a number of things you've said and that we've also heard throughout this series of podcasts, the technical details of the systems that we're describing matter. And it matters that policymakers and business leaders understand what we're actually talking about when we describe issues of cybersecurity and privacy and encryption and so forth. I think, as you put it, the the, the knowledge within the right levels of these organizations is, is hugely important. I think without that, we're not going to be able to identify all of the interconnections inherent in these policy decisions and frames. Uh, you know, I, I think so often we treat these issues in total isolation, uh, national security as a separate issue uh, than economic security or economic resilience, for example, here. And we now see these are increasingly aligned as they are with privacy and so on. And so we need leaders who are capable of seeing and governing those interconnections. And our hope is that through this podcast series that you, our listeners, have been able to notice and see a number of these interconnections and hopefully also improve your knowledge of the space a little bit. And well, I really want to thank you, Professor Landau and Colin, for this great journey and for your talk. And uh, I think that it should re be at least helping us into thinking about what the next move should be for cybersecurity policies and uh, make us think about you know, how we can all contribute to steering in the right direction. Thank you.